Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Chris and Jesse show with Chrissy and Jess. I'm your co-host, Chrissy. I'm Chris. Um, yeah, as you'll notice, um, that is not Jess. That is Chris. But um, that's okay. He can, not not nearly as pretty, but... Not nearly as pretty, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm extra pretty for the both of us. Uh, tonight, we have Justin Amash, Congressman Amash. He is um, a congressman from Michigan, and he is running for the Libertarian Party presidential nomination. Um, that will be um, on May 22nd uh, is our convention, where we'll be deciding who is going to be um, our leader. So... So tonight we are going to bring on 15 delegates that are going to talk to Congressman Amash. We're going to cover a lot of ground tonight, and we're going to talk to 15 delegates that are undecided that will vote at the convention. And we're going to take short questions and then uh, give uh, the congressman about three minutes to get through them all. And without further ado, let's get started, Chrissy. Yay! Hey, Hi, guys. Congressman Amash. How are you doing? Good. How are you? We're great. We're, We're doing really very well. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. Absolutely. So, Chrissy, do you want to get started with the first question? Yeah, let's go ahead and just jump right into it, guys. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to all of these delegates, give you a little brief bio about them. Um, first up, we have Morgan Rigg. He is an activist from the Libertarian Party of Indiana, and he has a question for you. Um, what's your question, Morgan? Okay, thank you. Uh Hi, Congressman. Uh, to, uh, to quote Bruce Willis, welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> um, uh, my question to you is this. Um, your campaign website was uh, recently launched, and while there's a way to donate or sign up for emails, uh, there's there's no way to volunteer. Um, how can people who want to join Team Amash uh, do so? Well, thanks for the question. Right now, you can contact us at contact at amashforamerica.com. We're working on uh, adding stuff to our website. Obviously, we want, we want to add some issues and add uh, an expanded opportunity for people to volunteer and purchase things and do other things on there. Um, but because we launched this campaign relatively quickly over the past couple of weeks, we, we wanted to get at least some stuff up there first. Uh, but you can reach us again at contact at amashforamerica.com if you'd like to help out. And we we need all the volunteers we can get. It's important that we have people from around the country helping out. This is going to be a national campaign. Um, I'm hoping to earn the nomination, but then we're going to take it really hard at the the other two candidates in the general. So um, thanks for the question. Awesome. All right. Up next, we have Mary Gerald, who currently serves as the Deputy 3rd District Coordinator for the LP of Kansas. She is the co-leader of the Kansas City Area Chapter of LOLA, that is the Ladies of Liberty Alliance. She is a former LP candidate for local and statewide races. So without further ado, Mary, what is your question? Uh, yes, Mr. Amash, in a recent town hall meeting online, you said that as president, you would give Congress 90 days to officially declare war in countries where we have troops engaged in conflict. Why not bring all the troops home immediately rather than allow another three months of death to innocent people for the sake of an official congressional declaration? Well, thanks for the great question. It's important that we have the people on our side when we do this, because if you go in there and you say, we're just gonna bring them home tomorrow, a lot of people will say, well, there is already authority to do all of these things overseas. There, there's already authority to go to war. And there will be a lot of people in Congress who say that there's already authority to do all of that. I don't agree that there's authority to do uh, the vast majority of what they're doing, like 90 something percent of it. So you tell Congress you have 90 days that puts them on the spot and flips the political pressure onto them. If they want to continue some of these wars, they can go to the American people and say to the people, we want to do... Uh, these actions in these countries. Uh, and if the people support it, then they can go ahead and try to authorize it. But uh, it puts the onus on Congress. And I think that's really important. I, we want to flip the script and restore the war making power to Congress and take it away from the presidency, which is what it is now. Right now, the president is basically calling all the shots. I want to take that away. The best way to do that uh, and have a permanent change is to uh, flip the script, tell them they have 90 days and put the onus on them and then start a uh, change the culture, start changing the culture in Washington so that they are um, not thinking about war powers the way they've been thinking about it for the past 50 years. 
All right, well, thank longer you, than three years, actually. It's been a, it's been a while since they um, actually declared a war. Thank you so much, Mary. Chrissy? Okay, so next we have Brian Waddell. Um, he serves as the Green Township, New Jersey representative to the Sussex County Solid Waste Advisory Council. Uh, Brian, what's your question? Um, every other LP candidate is a legitimate outsider. As a member of Congress for a decade, how do you propose to present yourself as someone who isn't a part of the swamp without relying on party labels? Yeah, that's a great question, Brian. And I've been an outsider in Congress for a long time. Uh, even though I've been a member of Congress, uh, I don't think that the Republican Party or the Democratic Party have thought of me as one of them in any real way. Uh, the way I operate in Congress is is totally different from the vast majority of the members of Congress. There's only maybe a couple members who are actually uh, pretty independent and libertarian. So I will be the outsider for the people because I want to change the way the system works and restore the constitutional functions in our government. I want to make sure that separation of powers works the way it's supposed to work. I want to make sure federalism works the way it's supposed to work. And there aren't really people in government right now who care about those things. I could count the people uh, in Congress who care about that on my finger. So I've really been an outsider, even though I've been within Congress. And, and I think it's really important to have someone who understands the problem. You know, it's nice to be a total outsider and say, hey, I've, I've nothing to do with this thing and I'm, I'm coming in, I'm going to change it. But actually, it's beneficial to be inside the system and have been an in outsider within the system saying to other people in Congress, you're doing it wrong. And even though I've been ignored largely by most of these members of Congress, as president, they can't ignore me the same way. And we will stand up for the people and, and change the way the system works. All right. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Next up is Michelle Randall. She is the Libertarian Party of Kentucky's fourth district chair. Michelle, please go ahead with your question. Great. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I know a few people at least who are concerned about you actually staying with the party based on what has happened in the past with multiple candidates and would really not to, like to get barred or welded again. And you've said you wanted to stay and help the party. I appreciate your positivity on thinking you can win this race. However, if you didn't happen to win the nomination, or even if you do, but you don't come out as our president, uh, what areas would you like to see yourself doing this? Would this be helping our nominee, running local, something else? Thank you. Yeah, th uh, thanks for the question. Well, first, it's important to... Um, know that I come at this as a libertarian, even though I've been a small L libertarian and not a big L libertarian. I have been a libertarian uh, throughout my life and I've been a libertarian in Congress. Uh, people can always disagree about particular issues and, and we, can, we can fight all day and night about what it means to be a libertarian. But the important thing is I really believe in the principles of liberty. Those are the things I fought for as a member of Congress. So when I'm coming over to the libertarian party, I'm not a person who's coming in and thinking this is not really um, something I identify with and then maybe I'll leave later on. No, I'm, I'm coming in because I believe in the Libertarian Party and I want to grow it as a party. Uh, I don't believe in what Republicans are doing. I don't believe in what Democrats are doing in Congress or in government. And I'm not intending to uh, go back to the Republican Party or be involved with those parties in any way. I'm not interested in it. I, I've tried that and I've seen that that is a thing that does not work for me or work for the American people. So I want to grow the party. Um, going forward, I will be someone who's assisting candidates for office. I'll be assisting the party as it, as it spreads the message of liberty. I'll find ways to uh, reach out to new people and bring them into the party. If we're going to be successful in electoral politics, we have to grow the party. It has to be a lot bigger than it is now. Um, that will involve... Uh, a lot of changes to the party going forward, but we have to be true to our principles as libertarians. And I think that's really important to have someone who is true to those principles, but understands how to reach other people. And I will use all of those skills to help the party, regardless of whether uh, I'm the nominee or whether I'm even running in a particular cycle. Would you consider um, like running for Congress? Thank again? you. 
I don't have a plan to run for Congress, but I, you know, like I've said before, I don't rule things out in life. I've said this many times, including about running for president. I don't want to totally rule out the idea that um, I would run for Congress again in the future, but that's not my interest right now. My interest is to make a change by running for president. And I think that's what has to happen. And then growing the party, trying to grow the party. There are lots of people who can run for office. We want to help as many people as possible. And it can't just be about one person. Um, one person is not going to change the system alone. We need a whole team working on it. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so on to our next delegate, um, Teresa Rushing. Uh, she lives in Texas and is the treasurer of the Tarrant County Libertarian Party. Um, what's your question, Teresa? Hi, Justin. First off, I want to say welcome home. I've been following your congressional career since 2012. And thank you for sticking to your principles. My question is, what are your thoughts on removing the prescription requirements for tried and true oral contraceptives? Thanks. That's a great question. And I would support that. Uh, I think that we want to make it easier to get uh, contraceptives and I'm supportive of that. So Simple clarify, enough. Simple mean... enough, Teresa. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Chrissy. Oh, I was just going to say, so yeah, that's very simple. Just take it away. Like, I mean, I've, you can buy it on the internet now. Yeah. There's, uh, if there's not a need for a prescription, like there's not a safety issue, then let's make it as easy as possible. Got it. Up next is Glenn Tuttle. He is from Pennsylvania and he serves as a county party chair and formerly served on the Meadville City Planning and Zoning Commission. Glenn, what's your question for Congressman Amash? Well, first off, welcome to the Libertarian Party, Congressman Amash. It's good to see you and hope you're around for many, many years to come. My question is, Thanks, will you support the libertarian principle of bodily autonomy? That includes uh, abortion, right to die legislation, sex work, and drug decriminalization. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I'm pro-life, um, and I think people know that. Uh, in practice, I think what that means as president is that I won't support federal funding of abortion providers. And uh, that's already a, a pretty longstanding position by a, a good portion of Congress, about half of Congress. Um, and I think the vast majority of libertarians would support that position too. But I am pro-life and, and uh, that's how I voted as a member of Congress. Um, but people know that and, and understand that as I'm, I'm coming into this process. And that's a that's a position that's pretty split within the party. As for um, the right to die, I think that uh, we need to make sure we are compassionate for people. For me, it comes down to whether there is a safe way to handle right to die. You don't want to create uh, the potential for abuses where someone comes in and um, creates an industry and are pressing people who are um, very sick or old into dying just to make money um, and are, are inducing people into, into taking this step. I think you have to be very careful about safety. I think you, you want people to be able to make decisions about um, how they might go at the end of the day, but you have to be careful about not creating incentives for abuse where people come in and are uh, pressing people to die. So that's something that I'm willing to look at and think about very carefully going forward as president. Uh, I support um, the right of sex workers to operate their businesses and, and uh, engage in their services. And I've, I've voted that way in Congress consistently to protect their rights. Um, I'm for uh, legalizing drugs at the federal level. I don't think it's the federal government's role to be um, criminalizing people for something, especially marijuana, for example, that is allowed at uh, the state level in many states now. All right. Well, thank you very much, Congressman. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Glenn. Um, okay, so on to our next delegate. Um, we have Christopher Gill, who is a state party leader here in Ohio. Um, he actually is newly elected to the Central Committee, uh, and he's a former public school teacher uh, Christopher, what's your question? Hello. Uh, good evening, Congressman. Thanks for taking a moment to uh, speak with us tonight. 
Uh, so my question is, it's kind of a two part. Should you win our nomination um, as folks like myself go around canvassing uh, for a libertarian candidate? First question we're going to get is what's the Libertarian Party? And then the next question we're going to get is uh, who do you guys have running and why should we vote for them? So my questions for you are what are the kinds of voters, demographics or what have you that you think uh, we have a shot at uh, getting their votes? And then what's the elevator pitch to them? Well, I think there is a broad segment of the public that is open to our party and open to libertarian ideas. And in fact, I th I've said this many times, I think that uh, the plurality or perhaps the majority of Americans are very closely um, inclined to support or very, high, very highly inclined to support libertarian ideas or classical liberal ideas because at the heart of Americanism, you know, th this American experiment that we have are these ideas of liberty and uh, the protecting protecting people's rights, so it's a natural thing for them to support. the uh, The point that has to be made when when you talk to people is to think through the issues one by one. I actually think that libertarianism is very appealing when you look at the issues one by one. It's actually in the abstract, ironically, because this is counter to what a lot of people think. It's actually in the abstract that maybe it's a little bit harder for people to grasp. They hear about libertarianism and they think uh, um, they have pretty biased views of what libertarianism is. You know, I get asked about traffic lights or are we going to have traffic lights or will we have roads or, you know, they, they come up with a lot of biased perspectives of what libertarianism is. And when you can get past that and talk about all sorts of issues and address their uncertainty about things, I think you can win people over. So it'll be about reaching out to everyone in this kind of campaign, for example, there are lots of young people, I think, who will be open to the Libertarian Party. You have two candidates in the Republican and Democratic Party who are from a very different generation and have a very different outlook on the world and on freedom. So um, we want to be able to reach out to those people. Uh, this will be the only campaign that really cares about civil liberties, about criminal justice reform, about wars. Um, they're about spending, you know, the, the crazy amount of spending we're doing in government. So there will be a lot of issues that affect young people that we can talk about during this campaign to bring them in. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Um, we have, uh, we're waiting on, um, the other, another delegate to hop on here. We're a little ahead of schedule. So if you don't mind, um, I have a question. Yeah, um, go ahead. So did you see that the Pentagon released um they they said that the footage of the ufos were real i did see that well i don't know if they uh, i mean we don't know if they're aliens but yes they showed that the footage was was actual <laughs> ufos in other words they don't know what they are so do you believe in aliens <laughs> yeah that's a good question i do yes you I do. Um, we, we have a we have a, a huge universe and i think it is um logical to believe in in other life throughout the universe. Uh, so do you think that aliens are libertarians and that's why they're leaving us alone? <laughs> well, I'll bet there are libertarian aliens um, somewhere. You know, the universe is big enough that there are probably socialist aliens and libertarian aliens. And uh, they, there might be aliens with, with our particular party name. So we, we just don't know, but we have a big universe, so it's all possible. It always starts with a federation and ends with an empire, though. Uh, <laughs> so I have a I have a question, and and this is one criticism that I've seen of your campaign, and that is the timing of you getting into the race. W what went into your decision in waiting to get into this race, running as an independent, and w frankly, what took you so long to join the race? Well. After I left the Republican Party, I thought it was appropriate to serve in Congress as an independent. I mean, uh, my beef with the parties was this two-party system, this uh, this devotion to party, this obsession with party, this idea that the party was supreme to everything else. I think that's a really unhealthy thing, and that would be an unhealthy thing within our party now liber as libertarians. That would be very unhealthy to have this view that the party is more important than the principles and more important than, than all the ideas and um, positions we take. So uh, I was concerned about 
sending the wrong message. I didn't want to leave a party and then jump into another party. Uh, I thought that wasn't the right thing to do. I knew that maybe someday I would consider going to the Libertarian Party, but that didn't seem like the right time to do it. I wanted to make sure that I was crystal clear that the parties are not a necessity um, and that our, the hope is that someday, in, including the Libertarian Party, won't be a necessity someday, that we can all just run for office as individuals and people can vote for us on the basis of our individual positions. I think that's a possibility. But in the near term, it's clear to me, and I'm by near term, I mean uh, certainly for the next decade, it's clear to me that you do have to have a strong competitor to the other parties. We have to build up another party that will strongly compete with Republicans and Democrats and take them on because that's the system people know right now. That's what they're comfortable with. They're still comfortable with the idea that you align yourself with a party. They're not ready yet for everyone in Congress to be independent and unaffiliated. Uh, we're just not there, but that'll be there someday. But for now, I wanna be a part of this party. I was starting to look at it um, back in February, actually. That's when I paused my congressional campaign. I stopped actively campaigning. I stopped fundraising. So uh, in February, I decided I'm going to look closely at this. And the only reason it was delayed longer than that, really, I mean, I would have made a decision probably in February, was that the coronavirus pandemic uh, happened. And as a result, I had to reassess everything. I had to make sure that I was able to care for my district as their representative, that I wasn't neglecting the service to my district. I didn't want to be distracted right then with a uh, political campaign. Uh, for president, for, for sure. I mean, that would that would be very complicated. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make sure I was focused on my constituents, focused on the legislation and doing the right thing for them. Once I felt we had done enough in Congress in terms of getting through some of the big legislative obstacles and taking care of some of the initial concerns of constituents, and there are ongoing concerns on both, both fronts, legislative and um, constituent concerns. But once I felt like we had dealt with some of the immediate emergency then I thought, now it's time to reconsider this uh, presidential campaign. And that's what I did uh, starting a few weeks ago and ultimately decided that this was something that was winnable, that there was a path to victory. I didn't want to jump into it if I didn't think there was a path to victory. Um, that doesn't mean I wouldn't have joined the Libertarian Party because it's, it's likely I would have joined the Libertarian Party either way. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that there was a path to victory if I was going to jump in for a presidential campaign. Um, and if I wasn't going to do it, uh, I almost certainly was going to be supportive of the Libertarian Party and supporting the Libertarian Party's nominee. All right. Thank you very much. Chrissy? Um, so what's the biggest risk you've ever taken in your life? <laughs> the biggest risk I've ever taken? I mean... Um, that's something I'd have to think about more carefully with, to say the biggest risk. Uh, I've taken you know, risks in Congress with some of my votes. I don't know that they're the biggest risks of my life. Um, you know, in some ways, running for president is a big risk. Uh, this, this is definitely up there as one of them. I was in a position to win re-election in my district. Uh, we were polling the district and, our, and we were ahead in the polls. We were fundraising the district and we were ahead in the fundraising by significant margins while I was um, still in the race. Uh, in fact, the the last quarter, the last full quarter where I fundraised, we raised as much as the 10 candidates in the race combined. So I felt very confident about winning the district again as an independent. And I had to decide whether it made sense to pursue that or proceed with a presidential run and ultimately decided that that this was a risk worth taking, but it is a risk. It definitely is something that um, was not easy. And, and I took a lot of time to think about because uh, I do enjoy representing my district. I'm honored to represent the district. It, it means a lot to me. And um, I feel like I can do a good job for the district as an independent um, in Congress. But I think the right thing to do was to jump into this race. Yeah, I'd say running for president qualifies up there as a big risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big one. Uh, our next uh, delegate is Stephen Paul Dieter. He is a professional voice actor. Stephen, please ask your question of Congressman Amash. Hey, Stephen. Hello, hello, Congressman Amash. So uh, there's a considerable amount of evidence to support the idea that one of the reasons why we currently suffer under the two-party duopoly as we do 
is because of the mathematics of the first past the post system itself. What's your opinion of uh, voting reform measures such as ranked choice voting or the single transferable vote? Thanks for your question. And I do support uh, trying different things. And perhaps it would be good if states started to, tr to experiment with more things first before you moved on to other levels of government. But um, I, I do think that we need a variety of options because one of the reasons people will say things like, oh, it's, we're stuck with these two parties and um, you just have to vote for one of these bad candidates is because they think it's not possible for a third party to be successful or a, a candidate outside of the two major parties to be successful. And it would be nice for a lot of people to be able to vote their conscience, to, to vote for the person they believe is the best candidate, and then know that as a backup, they can vote for someone else. And if, if my first choice doesn't win, and I still wanted Donald Trump or Joe Biden uh, as a second choice, they can pick one of those people. Uh, that would be, uh, for a lot of people, an easy way for them to vote what they believe without uh, having to feel like they, they're playing some kind of game um, to make sure that you know, they don't get the outcome that they like the least. So yeah, I support different, uh, different experiments in voting. Um, I think that, like I said, let's try it in a bunch of places and see how it works. And, uh, and then we'll try it at the federal level. Awesome. Um, so up next, we have Ashley Shade. She is a transgender woman and the Deputy Director of Outreach and Policy for Outright Libertarians. And she's a campaign volunteer for pretty much every candidate that's running for anything right now. What's your Hi, question, Ashley? Ashley? Hello, Congressman. Um, my question is this. You were recently quoted in a Forbes article that the Civil Rights Act uh, protects the rights of transgender individuals. Uh, what is your plan to ensure that the rights of LGBTQ People are protected, especially in the areas of um, healthcare, education, and employment. Well, thanks for your question, and it's a great one. I think that uh, any current civil rights laws, any current equality laws that already include other categories of protection should also include uh, transgender persons as a protected category. I don't think we should be deciding that some categories are protected and then uh, other categories, which are very, very obvious to people uh, in needing protection should be left out. I think we should be fair and treat people equally. I, I'm not sure that all of these categories of uh, protection are necessary in the long run. There may be reasons to reform the way civil rights laws work and equality laws work, depending on the situation. For example, there may be, um, discrimination that happens in certain settings because of some of these laws, like in employment settings, you may have actually more discrimination because uh, some people who are worried about potential liability end up not hiring people who are more diverse. Um, so there are, there are, there's potential for discrimination by having some of these laws, but to the extent that you have the laws, you should be fair. You should include transgender persons and, and other people who are facing very real discrimination. All right, thank you so much, Ashley. Next up is Jen Bryson. She is a former campaign manager and a candidate from Arizona. Jen, please ask your question. Hi, Congressman Amash. Welcome Hi, to Jen. the Libertarian Party. One of the big challenges that we face uh, is that most people really don't understand what libertarian even means. So how would you explain what libertarian means to people outside the party? Thanks. That's a great question. Uh, for, to me, libertarianism is at its core about protecting people's rights. And it's also, at least in the political sense, about having some humility as a government. In other words, having a government that recognize it, recognizes that it doesn't know everything, that there are millions of people across the United States who every day are dealing with circumstances that the government is not aware of. And the government is not able to make decisions for every single person. It's not possible. It's impossible to calculate. And it would be a big waste of time for the government to do it anyways, because it would be less efficient than allowing people to sort things out 
on the ground. Um, th these are what Hayek calls the particular circumstances of time and place. These are things every day that only you know about that the government doesn't know about. For example, you know about um, the particular pothole in your neighborhood, or you know that someone is mad at you, or you know that a particular um, grocery store has things at a certain hour and not at another hour. There are lots of things that you know about that uh, allow you to make decisions much better than the government. And we want to protect people's rights to make those decisions. Sometimes when people hear that we want things to be localized as much as possible, what they think we mean is we're okay with discrimination and other things. And that is absolutely not true. Um, and, and first of all, it's important to note that the 14th Amendment protects all individuals across the United States from discrimination. There's a due process clause, there's an equal protection clause. Those are designed to protect individuals from discrimination. So nobody is okay with that um, from a constitutional standpoint. And libertarians also, because we believe so much in the protection of rights, we don't want anyone to be discriminated against by the government uh, or anyone else. We want people to live together in harmony. And we believe the best way to do that is by having a system that really depends on voluntary interactions as much as possible, rather than forced interactions by the government or a bunch of um, nudging and heavy handed action by the government. Thank you so much, Jen. Chrissy? All right. Um, next up, we have John Phillips Jr. Uh, he is running for city council in Illinois and is a regional representative on the Libertarian National Committee. What's your question, John? Hi, Congressman. Um, hey, as John. a former vice presidential candidate and current regional representative, it is important to me that our delegates get to know our candidates. Uh, given your late entry and the current impossibility of physical campaigning, would you be willing to take part in a virtual town halls with the delegates in my region of eight Midwestern states? I am more than happy to assist you in setting up those opportunities. Thanks, John. And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I love doing those kinds of things. I love town halls in real life. It's one of my favorite uh, activities as an elected official, getting out and, and talking to the people and talking about ideas and hearing their questions and having the back and forth and um, having people who are supportive and also people who are not supportive and hearing from all of them. I think that's that's really important and helps me grow as an elected official and also grow as a candidate in this case. I want to make sure that I have the trust of libertarians as I run for this office. I don't want to come in and feel like people nominated me just because uh, more people know my name and maybe I'll get some media attention or whatever the case may be. I don't think that's the most important thing. The most important thing is that we have a candidate who can convey the message and re represents the people in the party very well. I think that that's the, per that's the kind of person we want as a nominee. And so I'm absolutely thrilled to uh, meet with delegates and talk with them and would love to have you assist with that if, if that's a thing you're interested in. And please reach out to contact at amashforamerica.com and, and let us know how we can help. Will do. Thanks. All right, up next is Jill Pyatt. She served as chair of the Libertarian Party of Pasadena Glendale region for eight years and is now the county vice chair. Go ahead Hello. with your question, please. Hi, Joe. You ready for my question? Yes. Yes. Um, Mr. Amash, I'm wondering what you would say to your party. I'm wondering what you would say to all the other candidates. If you do become our party candidate, what will you say to all the people that spent a year of their lives, so much money and so much time going around to conventions hoping for the nomination and then to have you come in at the last minute. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good question, Jill. And what I would say is I respect and honor their work. I think what they're doing is very important to build the party. I think it's really important that, that candidates do get out there and spread the message. Every situation is different. And, and my situation is the way it is. You know, I'm a member of Congress and, and I had some duties that I was responsible for. And I had to make some uh, very important decisions about whether to take this step. It will be up to the delegates to decide who the nominee is, but I definitely respect the uh, time and, and work that other people have put into it. And I think we all need to work together going forward, no matter who the nominee is, to continue to spread the message of liberty and, uh, and grow the party so that we can reach new people. So thanks for your question. 
Thank you, Jill. Oh, all right. Um, Amber Christiansen Beltran is our next delegate. Uh, she is the former chair of the Utah party and a, uh, again, like Ashley Shade, volunteers for everything. <laughs> um, Amber, what's your question? Oh. <laughs> okay, so I have two questions because we're running a little bit ahead of schedule. So I'm going to throw in one. So my first one, so last Halloween, I dressed up as Frederick Bastia. <laughs> and so I'm I'm curious um who are the philosophers of libertarianism that influence you? And then my second part is um I've I've heard you mention before that you were involved in some legislation to get rid of the Federal Department of Education and I'd like to hear what that sounds like, what that would look like um if it was implemented. So, mm -hmm. philosopher education. Okay, great. Thanks for the question, Amber. Uh I think people who know me would know that that Hayek is the number one influence on me. Um, when I was first thinking about my political philosophy, I uh, probably didn't describe it as libertarian, even though I've been a libertarian since I was a child, I think, you know, based on my personality and my um, rejection of arbitrary authority. I was never a big fan of arbitrary authority. So, as I started to look into my political philosophy, Hayek was the one who popped up first. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the, his concept of local knowledge, the utilization of local knowledge, and the idea of emergent order, um, that order emerges out of uh, human action uh, over sometimes many years. And also he has a strong respect for tradition. I think that's important, and it's an important part of libertarianism that we also have some respect for traditions and existing institutions, that we not think that libertarianism is about overthrowing the whole system overnight, because there are things that develop over many years that are um, crucial to ensuring our liberty and protecting us as individuals, protecting our rights. And we don't want to just uh, throw them out overnight. We have, to, we have to actually be deliberative and careful about what we do. Um, it's a bit of arrogance, actually, to think that we can redesign the whole system from scratch. We have to be respectful of institutions that are beyond our comprehension. So Hayek is an important influence in my life. Bastiat, obviously, is an important influence to me. Um, Henry Hazlitt, Mises, of course. Um, there are many people in the, uh, I guess, libertarian sphere who have who have been influential to me. Um, and uh, as for your um, your second question, remind me of the second question. Someone can remind me. Oh, the Department of Education. You, oh, the Department you of Education, helped, yeah. You had helped put forth some legislation, I guess, to yes. disband it, or I just, I wanna know what that would look like if it was actually implemented. That's something yeah, I'm okay. passionate sure. about, so. Yeah, thanks, Amber. So um, I'm a co-sponsor of uh, a bill, Thomas Massey's bill to, uh, eliminate the Department of Education. I don't think we need a federal Department of Education. I think it mostly serves a, as a big bureaucracy to make education worse for our kids and reduce the amount of resources available to students. Uh, you, you as a taxpayer end up sending money to Washington. It gets moved around a, a bunch of ways among bureaucrats who make a lot more money than our teachers do. And then uh, they add a bunch of restrictions in place and they add a bunch of um, rules about how kids are going to be educated and they send some of the money back to us, but not all of the money. And in the end, it only ends up being about 10% of the education funding that a state like Michigan gets anyway. So we get all of these strings and other things that make our education system worse. And all of that is just for 10% of the money. And we could have just kept the money and educated the kids better ourselves. Um, there are some people who worry about discrimination that may happen in the education system uh, that are, it's currently handled by the Department of Education. You could ha have the Department of Justice handle a lot of that instead of the Department of Education. So it doesn't have to be within that department. I just think that with the Department of Education at the federal level, you're just moving a bunch of money around, adding a bunch of strings and not really getting a lot of bang for your buck. Um, so I would get rid of it, and I think most people would not miss it. They they would have more money for their schools and get better outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. 
Thanks so much, Amber. Up next is Bennett Morris. He is the former state chair of the Libertarian Party of Illinois and will be running for Congress in the Illinois 5th District. Bennett, hey, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, uh, and welcome to the party, Congressman. Um, I am very passionate about our platform and I serve on the National Platform Committee. Um, I assume that you have uh, read the platform or read the platform before you joined. Um, what is your favorite part of the platform and your least favorite part of our platform? Thank you. So I've, I've read the platform and uh, my favorite part of the platform is the overall theme. Uh, there's no other party that has a theme centered on the protection of rights. And from the very beginning of the platform, you have a strong focus on rights, that that is what the purpose of government is. That's why it exists. And that's what we're about as libertarians, protecting people's rights. So, so the overall theme of the platform to me is really important. Uh, I think that what's a bit challenging for someone like me, of course, is the, uh, the life versus abortion issue, which in the platform, there's basically a neutral stance on it. Um, for me, as a pro-life person, I think that uh, being pro-life is a libertarian position and a very strongly libertarian position. But I understand the difficulties and the challenges within the party and that there are people who have uh, reasonable disagreements about that. But that's probably the toughest one for me. There's also some uh, uh, issues with how we do taxation. I think that we want to reduce taxes as much as possible, but it will not be possible any, any time in the short run to have, for example, a very voluntary based system that is um, – all user fees, for example, or something like that. There will have to be some kind of tax code and we need to find ways to get to that better place And as we continue to push people toward a system that is uh, more voluntary. But there's, there's no way right now in the short run to have uh, anything other than a substantial reform to the tax code that makes it fairer, but it's not going to completely eliminate taxes anytime soon. Thank you so much, Bennett. Chrissy? So um, our last delegate question um, before we kind of have some fun um, <clears throat> is from Deborah Altman. She is um, a registered libertarian that was elected in a nonpartisan election as a council member for the citywide council for District 75 school in New York City. It's a unique education district of all special needs students that spans all five bureaus. Uh, she's also the council treasurer and the Staten Island liaison for the council. All right, De Deborah, you ready? Yes. Hello, Congressman. I Hi, have Deborah. two questions for you. Uh, the first one is going to be about special education because that's uh, who my constituents are. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is a federal law that governs free, appropriate education to 7 million children with disabilities in the nation <laughs> across uh, with an IEP. But it's a long, ongoing, complicated legal process from beginning to end. <laughs> Um, to navigate along without law degrees, help, guidance, or any required advanced knowledge of their rights or what schools and service options are for their children. It causes thousands of violations to occur every year with impartial hearings Hello. taking years to resolve. It's my daughter. Uh, it is a constant battle. It is a constant battle against the massive bureaucratic education system, and it is a top-down administration, like you said earlier, and there is no school choice. Uh, so I just want to know what your thoughts are on special education in this country. And if nominated and elected, what would you do as president to help special need parents to ensure the schools follow the laws on special education? And what consequences would you put in place if they didn't? The second question is a little bit more personal. As a fellow Syrian American, such as yourself, how did you personally take the war that was going on over there and how the United States handled it? Thank you. Yeah, th thanks so much for your questions. The first question is actually a, a very challenging question. It's probably the most challenging question of the night. And that's how we deal with uh, students who have special needs in our education system. And um, I, I have to spend more time looking at all the various aspects of the laws. Uh, it's because it's not a simple issue. And as you, as you explained, there's a convoluted mess for a lot of parents who want to get the best education for their children. I can tell you that as president, I would make sure that we do have a system that uh, that assists people who are in need, that helps those families, that is simple and doesn't take forever. I don't think that we need a system where 
um, you have a concern about how your child is being educated and it takes years to get it resolved. That's not fair to the families. It's definitely not fair to the students. And, um, and it's not fair to teachers as well who are, who are educating them. So we have to make sure that we have a system that can resolve these issues very quickly. As I said, I'm not in favor of the Federal Department of Education. I think that we could bring some of these things under the Department of Justice, depending on um, the particular issue. But we want to bring as much under the Department of Justice to ensure people are getting fair treatment under the law and um, aren't having their adjudication delayed in a way that is harmful to the students. So I will focus on it, but I'm actually going to need the help of, of uh, people like you to uh, walk me through the system and talk to me about the problems so I can learn and, and become better at this and uh, serve you in the best way possible as president. I, th I think it's important. I, my commitment is to spend time talking to people about their real problems that are facing them and try to learn Again, like I said earlier in tonight's broadcast, that I don't know everything about everything. I'm a, a member of the government right now. I'm a person like anyone else. I think one of the problems we have in government is too many people pretending they know everything about everything, and they don't. And members of Congress don't know half of the stuff, n more than half of the stuff that they're voting on. They probably don't know 90% of the stuff they're voting on, yet they act like they know everything about everything. So we need some more humility and we need uh, to hear from people like you about those issues. As for your second question, uh, as, a, um, as a person of Syrian ancestry, I am not uh, fond of what's going on in the Middle East. I think that a lot of people in government don't understand the um, systems over there and the culture over there and why there's so much conflict. And uh, we need to be better educated about it and I think that it's important that we not get into a whole bunch of crazy interventions where we think we can impose our system on people in different parts of the world. It, it doesn't work that way. They have conflicts that have sometimes been going on for decades or centuries, and we need to be able to um, think about ways to assist peace rather than always looking for ways to resolve it through war or through fighting. Uh, and, and too often the solution has just been, hey, let's bomb some people and that will fix things. But that doesn't fix things. That, that usually just ends up killing people and killing a lot of innocent people who uh, maybe we wanted to help. And, and that's really unfortunate. So we want to get out of these wars, not start new wars, have a uh, humble foreign policy that is not an isolationist foreign policy. Let's be clear but it's a foreign policy that doesn't resolve to war. That's not our, that should not be our first choice. That should be our last line of defense and that's to defend the United States or maybe to prevent something like a, a massive genocide where there's a total inequity between the sides. Um, but you know, it's not to just go to war to um, resolve issues that are way more complicated than maybe we want to believe. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. So, Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> so speaking of Syria, um, my 14-year-old son is actually um, Syrian as well. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah. So he was actually, um, we've talked to him about it, about you running, and it's just definitely something he's never seen in his lifetime. And going from someone like Trump with his kind of hateful rhetoric, I think it's nice for my son to be able to see someone um, who's also part Syrian running for office. So, Thanks. No question. And, I just wanted to say no, I, I appreciate that. You know, sometimes I get asked about my ancestry and background and, and my family feels so blessed to be in the United States. You know, my, I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan here. So I, I feel fortunate to have been born here. Um, but my dad came here as a refugee. He's a Palestinian refugee. My mom is a Syrian immigrant. And sometimes I get asked about, um, issues related to the Middle East and um, and what I think and, and how I can help with things. And one of the ways I think I can be very helpful is by presenting a good role model for people, by showing people, here is someone of Palestinian ancestry and Syrian ancestry, and it's a person we can relate to. Uh, oftentimes, people from those parts of the world are depicted in very stereotypical ways. And uh, there are people of those backgrounds throughout the United States, whether they're 
uh, Christian, Muslim, or Jewish who have, um, you know, who would surprise people. I think they would not fit the stereotypes that they might imagine. And they're, they're very American. They love this country. And, um, and I want to be that role model for people to, for people to see a good example and, uh, and understand that we can uh, resolve our problems through discussion. And it doesn't always have to be a clash of cultures or um, putting people down or insulting them based on their backgrounds. Totally agree. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I host the We Are Libertarians podcast and on our social media, I see multiple times a day that people are not willing to support you because of an MSNBC interview where you said that you were for the universal basic income. So I'd like to ask you, what do you believe about the universal basic income? Do you support it or are you against it? Yeah, in that interview, I didn't say I was for uh, UBI. Uh, what I said was that I would consider it if it were linked to perhaps an elimination of the entire social welfare state. So you can't just layer a UBI on top of our existing welfare system and expect it to work. You have to rework the entire system. Now, if you replace the uh, welfare state with the UBI, I think that there's uh, some compelling reason to support that as a libertarian, that it would reduce the amount of government involved. You'd actually lower costs overall for taxpayers and you would reduce the amount of government and give people more control over their lives. You wouldn't have the government, um, you know, running a, a thousand programs to uh, give people benefits here and there. And there's all sorts of uh, transaction costs and bureaucracy. Let's get that all out of the way. That'll actually reduce the size of government. But you, those have to go hand in hand. It's not a UBI that we layer on top of our current system. You have to get rid of that system. I think uh, in, the, in the context of COVID-19, the only thing I've said is that an emergency sort of UBI, it wouldn't really be a UBI because it would be only for a period of the emergency, that emergency cash payments are a much better alternative to the convoluted package they passed that cost $3 trillion plus. Uh, you're better off having direct payments to the people uh, that go over the course of the emergency you would do it at a way lower cost. People would be much more satisfied and you wouldn't leave people out who need the help as uh, is happening right now. A lot of people who need the help are being left out and those who are in um, connected places, they're getting the benefits they need very quickly. So would it be a leading issue for you if you were president or, or in this campaign? I don't think it would be a leading issue, um, but I'm open to the concept if we, like I said, we coupled it with uh, an elimination of the welfare state, which is a big change. That's not a small thing. And it's certainly not the kind of thing that um, you say propose overnight and it happens the next day. This is a long conversation and people have to move in that direction. It, it, I don't know how you do it exactly incrementally, but you would have to have some kind of incremental move in that direction. Um, you Maybe you'd start with a very small UBI uh, with, with some significant elimination of the welfare state. But, you know, I'm not at the point where that's something I'm campaigning on or proposing. It's just that I'm open to it. And it's not good to be a leader whose mind is closed to all of these things. You know, we have to be open to ideas. There are lots of ways to move the country in a more libertarian direction that don't mean just eliminating all of government overnight. We have to think about how we do things. Um, and sometimes in an incremental improvement can be a significant step toward uh, moving us in a, in a much more rights-oriented direction. Well, allow me to scream and yell and call you not a real libertarian then for having policy solutions, <laughs> <laughs> Congressman. <laughs> Chrissy, uh, go ahead. So um, I know you were just on Bill Maher the other day. Um, how does it feel to be on a much more famous show right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is... Uh, uh, I'm happier to be on here right now. So, you know, it's, <laughs> Woo, actually, I'm going to quote you on that. <laughs> yeah. The, the audio is better on here. Honestly, um, <laughs> I, mean, I have to work it out next time with Bill. If I'm on the show again, we, we had a little bit of trouble with the audio, so I couldn't hear him very clearly, uh, which, you know, I ended up being a little more aggressive than I wanted to be on a couple points <laughs> because I couldn't hear him, but you know, it's working out here. So when you wake up one morning and you look down at your own Twitter, I assume you look at your own Twitter. 
Um, and the president of the United States with his giant uh, bullhorn has tweeted about you. What is that experience like? And what, how do you personally react? Uh, I mean, the, the most recent one, I was just kind of like, meh, like I didn't, I didn't <laughs> react at all. Really. I don't know. I, it didn't, didn't mean much to me. Um, really, I've been more upset in the past when the president has gone over, gone after my friends. Um, he's, he's attacked people like Mark Sanford. Um, he's attacked people like Thomas Massey. That kind of stuff gets me more upset because I know them and they're good people. And, uh, I think it's, it's probably easier to get upset about your friends getting attacked. And when I get attacked, I kind of just, you know, it's fine. It doesn't bother me as much because I know who I am and I know what I'm about and I don't, I don't worry about it as much, but when he attacks my friends, that's, um, that's something I, I don't really like. Do your mentions especially just when I, especially like when I saw like Mark Sanford when he was very vicious to Mark Sanford, and he even came to a Republican conference meeting and slammed Mark Sanford in front of all of his colleagues, uh, you know, sitting there in person. And I did not like that at all. I thought that was despicable. Um, you know, he's a member of our Republican conference. He was at the time. And he deserved some respect as one of our colleagues and friends. And I thought for no one to stand up for him was, was really disgusting. And so I stood up for him and, um, you know, and, and that's what I would do for my friends. I, you know, that's just how I feel about it. So it, were some of those moments contributors to this decision? Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about it that the, Republican Party has taken a very bad turn, and uh, that ultimately led to my leaving the party and probably wouldn't be here today if not for the Republican Party going in a direction that was completely contrary to what I thought it would, uh, the direction it would take years ago. When I joined the Republican Party, um, as a candidate at least, you know, I'd been a Republican growing up, but we don't have party, we don't have party registration in Michigan. So you sort of just, you know, you say you're a Republican and you don't really register. But when I ran for office as a Republican, I thought that I could change the party and um, make it a more liberty oriented party. And, and I realized that I couldn't ultimately. And a big contribution to that was Donald Trump. But, you know, the party was shifting long before he joined the party. You know, I mean, he wasn't a Republican himself. Uh, he was a Democrat or something else in the past. But he came into the party and it had already been shifting. You know, the groundwork had already been laid for someone like Donald Trump to um, to come in and, and take over the party. But yeah, the, the, the culture of the party is what dominates now. You know, it's not a party about any principles. It's more a party about um, personalities. And that's not something I want to be a part of. So I worked for the Libertarian Party during the Ron Paul years, during those campaigns, and it was always tough to have Republican Libertarians say to me, like, oh, change it from the inside. So do you feel that that strategy, I mean, it's probably not universal, but overall, is that strategy something that just doesn't work? Changing a party from the inside? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it, it probably doesn't work at the scale of the Republican and Democratic Party uh, unless you have... Um, someone get elected to president. I mean, there's many ways in which Donald Trump uh, had a somewhat revolutionary change to the party, but in terms of at least tone, not in terms of policies, the policies are about the same. I mean, I, I don't think he's changed the policies as much as people like to believe. It's basically Mitch McConnell running the show, um, which is how it was before. It's, it's no different. Basically, the policies were the same as Mitch McConnell's policies or John Boehner or Paul Ryan, there's not really a big difference between the Trump Republican party on policies and the John Boehner, Mitch McConnell party on policies, but the tone and, and personality focused aspect of the party, that's very different. Um, it's, I think it's hard to change a party from the inside that is so entrenched like these two parties. The problem you face when you go into um, Congress is that the leaders have so much power. Nancy Pelosi has so much power. Kevin McCarthy has so much power. You have the same issue in the Senate where the leadership, they dominate the party. And as a result, if you don't toe the line, if you don't fall in line with the party leaders, you are just um, 
excommunicated. Basically, they they don't want to have anything to do with you. They dry they try to dry up your fundraising. They try to defeat you in a primary, and it becomes uh, very difficult then to even make changes. Your um, colleagues will start to shun you and other things. So it becomes very difficult to actually change things from the inside. In order to get into a position of power within those parties, you have to suck up to the leadership. You have to do what they want. You have to take the bad votes. They they require you to take the bad votes. If you take a good principled vote, you are not going to be part of the team. So yeah, changing those parties from the inside is, uh, I think, an impossibility uh, and not happening anytime soon. So um, Congressman, I am a, an Ohio State alum. Can I get a go Bucks from the Michigan? <laughs> no, you can't. Cool. Sorry, go blue. What is okay? I'm done. Okay, there's 55 people or 45 people in the Ohio delegation, well, and you just listen, I love the people of Ohio, and I have lots of friends from Ohio, but <laughs> okay, I'm a, well, I'm I'm a Wolverine. Say, I'm a okay, Wolverine. I'm gonna make a meme of you, and it's gonna be you and Ohio State stuff. So you're welcome. Yeah, um, I hear it from Nick Gillespie all the time, too. So. <laughs> um, so I um I have one final really important question, um, Mr. Amash. Will you accept my friend request? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know you had one out there for me, but I will I accept it. I even keep going unclicking and refriending just so <laughs> it's right. popping up well, at the top. I'm that kind of annoying. I'll try to find it. I'll try to find it and, and I'll accept it. Okay, I'll be the I'll be the cutest one there. <laughs> <laughs> um okay, so we're gonna wrap up a little bit. Um, just to let everyone know, we're having a Zoom after party where we'll be talking about this show. Congressman Amash, I know you're super busy, but if you'd like to, you can come join us. I think I got to spend a little time with my family tonight. <laughs> Thank family, you. man. Okay, well, see, we're libertarians. We're socially awkward. We don't talk to our family. We just go on Zoom. So. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So um, we really, really appreciate you taking the time out to come on um, the most famous libertarian show. And uh, th again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our delegates have got a lot from this. Um, we'll be sharing this around. Uh, any last words for everyone? Well, just uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I want to earn the respect of the delegates, the trust of the delegates, the votes of the delegates. And please check out amashforamerica.com if you can help out. As I said before, we're going to continue expanding the website and we'll bring some new things to it. But uh, if you'd like to support us with a donation or signing up for emails, um, that would be helpful too. We want to start getting the message out to more and more people. Okay, awesome. Again, thank you so much, Congressman. We really yeah, appreciate thank you. it. Thanks for coming to our party. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you.